The focus of this video is on membrane transport. Uh, what we want to understand is how cells regulate the movement of materials across their cell membranes, a really important uh, function of cell membranes. Uh, going into this discussion, it's assumed that you already have a little bit of a foundation in basic concepts related to diffusion and osmosis, how substances move in their environment, the driving forces for that, as well as the structure of the cell membrane itself. You have an understanding already that it's a mosaic, referred to as a fluid mosaic, made up of a phospholipid backbone uh, as well as embedded membrane protein. So if you haven't yet covered those topics, you probably want to go and get a little bit of a foundation in that. This discussion will make a whole lot more sense to you if you do. So there are several different ways that uh, substances can be transported across the cellular membrane. Let's just take the simplest possible scenario, what's referred to as uh, simple diffusion. So as its name implies, this is just plain old diffusion. It just happens to be occurring across the cell membrane. So I'll just remind you very briefly, uh, the backbone of the cell membrane is uh, comprised of phospholipids, right? And we can represent phospholipids in this sort of cartoon blobby diagram way, uh, where this round structure at the top is the head group. Uh, it's actually electrically charged, carries a charge. And so it is what's called hydrophilic, meaning it interacts readily with water. Now the phospholipid also has two fatty acid tails connected to that head group. And those tails are hydrocarbon tails, which are nonpolar, right? And because they're nonpolar, they do not interact with water and that property is referred to as being hydrophobic. So a phospholipid has a hydrophilic head group, hydrophobic tail groups, and because it has that dual nature when phospholipids are in an aqueous envir environment, like a watery cell, um, they will spontaneously self-associate with one another to form the phospholipid bilayer where they um, align in such a way that their hydrophilic heads are interacting with water and their hydrophobic tails are not, and we get something that looks like this, very simple um, phospholipid bilayer head groups on either side interacting with water on the outside and inside of the cell, right? So this would be the outside, this would be the inside of the cell. And the hydrophobic tails, those nonpolar tails tucked away to the interior. All right, so in the case of simple diffusion, we're talking about the movement of substances down their concentration gradient, meaning that the direction of movement is from high concentration to low concentration. Now, in thinking about the properties of the cellular membrane, if you've got, let's say, a high concentration of something outside the cell, right, low concentration of that whatever it is inside the cell, the only way that that substance is going to be able to move by simple diffusion directly through the cell membrane is if it's capable of dissolving into the interior of that cell membrane and then passing through to the other side. Right? So what sorts of things do you imagine would be able to dissolve into this uh, interior region of the membrane? Well, these are going to be substances that have the same chemical properties as, as that interior of the membrane, namely that they're nonpolar. Now the other thing is that they have to be small because if it's a large molecule, it's going to disrupt the structure of the phospholipid bilayer, and that's just not favored. Uh, that type of interaction is not favored. So we're talking about small, nonpolar molecules, right? And what sort of a thing might be a small, nonpolar molecule? Well, molecular oxygen is a good example. Uh, the chemical structure and molec molecular structure of oxygen looks like this. Two oxygens doubly bonded to one another. This is a nonpolar molecule. So oxygen can readily dissolve into the interior of the membrane and pass right through. Carbon dioxide is another nonpolar molecule. Looks like this. Oxygen, carbon, oxygen, nonpolar overall. Um, so you know, we can see oxygen and carbon dioxide, these, these gases diffusing across cell membranes with oxygen being uh, moved into cells, carbon dioxide, a cellular waste product being moved out of the cell uh, by the simple process of diffusion through the cell membrane. Another uh, thing that can move directly through the cell membrane is um, a class of lipids that we've already talked about, steroids. Steroids are based on a cholesterol backbone. They're all derived from cholesterol. 
and like cholesterol they can dissolve into the membrane so these would be you know for example steroid hormones like testosterone or estrogen they can also dissolve into the membrane now the only exception uh, to this small nonpolar rule and it's a big one it's an important one um, is water so an exception to this is water water as we know uh, it is small but it is definitely not nonpolar in fact it's very polar uh, but despite the fact that it's polar water can be driven through cell membranes uh, in the process of osmosis and we've talked about this before and part of the reason that water can do that uh, is the fact that it is so small the other thing that comes into play is that there are just so many water molecules in the cellular environment both outside the cell and inside the cell so because of the high concentration of water that we're dealing with um, water can be driven through this unfavorable interaction through the membrane uh, to, in, in the process of, of diffusion and we've already defined that um, special case of diffusion of water we know what that's called that's osmosis now one thing to recognize about osmosis as it occurs through the bilayer is that's relatively slow and we're going to talk in just a minute about uh, a, a way that cells have for speeding up the movement of water through the membrane if we have specific cells that need uh, to do that quickly they have a mechanism for doing that All right so simple diffusion is the uh, transport of materials that are capable of dissolving into the cell membrane moving down their concentration gradients passing from one side to another but what about substances that are not small and nonpolar what about substances that are for example charged uh, things like ions things like uh, polar molecules like glucose or or amino acids how do they get through the cell membrane well those substances require assistance right they they need help their transport through the membrane has to be facilitated and this form of transport is referred to as facilitated so facilitated diffusion once again is diffusion it's it's the movement of materials from high concentration to low concentration but it must be facilitated it relies on uh, the presence of a membrane protein right so that diffusion is not occurring directly through the cell membrane it's occurring through a protein embedded in that cell membrane and I'm going to go ahead and draw cell membrane I'm not going to draw the phospholipids because that's kind of tedious so I'm, my cell membrane is just going to be a big yellow stripe here and I'll add in some uh, membrane proteins so um, the membrane proteins that uh, allow facilitated diffusion can occur in a number of different sort of shapes and structures uh, we're going to talk about the simplest one first uh, and these are referred to as channels or sometimes called pores they basically form kind of a barrel through the membrane that allows specific substances and that's an important important concept specific substances to move down their concentration gradient and cross the membrane right so these would be polar or charged molecules things like ions glucose amino acids right now again this is important to recognize that this is a specific interaction so if for example these are sodium ions if we also had calcium ions out here they wouldn't be able to pass through the same channel right they wouldn't fit so this is a selective transport of a particular substance through the membrane via this uh, specific transport protein this this specific channel now one example of a type of a channel um, that's has a lot of biological importance is the class of channels referred to as aquaporins aquaporins are water channels and they are particularly abundant in the membranes of cells that have to move a lot of water quickly across their membrane so as we just said uh, the movement of water through the bilayer it does happen but it's relatively slow uh, it's not favored and cells that need to move a lot of water quickly will have these aquaporin channels uh, which specifically allow the movement of water under uh, osmotic gradients to, to, to pass in or out of the cell 
All right, so those are channels. Another type of protein that participates in facilitated diffusion uh, is referred to as a carrier protein. And the way that this works is you basically have a protein that can exist in one of two alternate shapes. Right? So this is a protein that changes shape. And that shape change is actually how the substance being transported gets across the membrane. So these are called carrier proteins. And these carriers move substances by changing shape. All right? So shape change. So the way this works is you would have a substance which binds to the protein. And that binding actually induces the change in shape that leads to that substance being translocated across the membrane. But again, this would be transport down a concentration gradient, moving a substance from high to low concentration. Because facilitated diffusion and simple diffusion are both examples of substances moving down their concentration gradient from high concentration to low, the energy for that movement or the driving force for that movement actually is supplied by the concentration gradient. So these are referred to as uh, passive transport. Passive transport uh, simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion does not require an additional energy input by the cell. Right? The energy is supplied by the concentration gradient itself. But let's say that a cell needs to transport a material against its concentration gradient, that is low to high. In that case, the cell actually will have to expend additional energy to make that happen. And that's called active transport. So let's take a look now at active transport and see how that occurs. So active transport involves the movement of materials across the cell membrane against their concentration gradient. So in this case, materials are being moved from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Now because we're going against the concentration gradient here, the cell actually has to expend some energy to make that happen. Right? So energy input by the cell is required. And that energy is going to be in the form, directly or indirectly, of ATP, that universal energy currency used by all cells to drive cellular work of various forms. All right, so let's take a look at see how this active transport works. I'm drawing my phospholipid bilayer. The proteins that participate in active transport structurally are, are um, very similar to those carriers that we just talked about. Right, they're proteins that can exist in one of two different shapes. So let's just draw these here across the membrane in these alternate shapes. All right, now the difference is that here we're talking about moving something from an area of low concentration. So we've got a few of these guys over here, a whole bunch of them over here, to an area of high concentration. All right, whatever the solute is. We're moving it against the concentration gradient from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So this protein can bind to this solute and this is where the difference comes in between active transport and passive transport by these carrier proteins. If this was passive transport then binding of the solute would cause the shape change. With active transport instead what happens is that an ATP molecule will interact with this protein and in the process, that ATP gets broken apart into ADP and phosphate. And that phosphate remains bound to this carrier protein. And that phosphate, when it binds to this carrier protein, induces a shape change in the protein that causes it to flip to its other conformation, its other shape. And in the process, that solute gets moved to the other side of the membrane. All right, oops, I forgot to include my little phosphate. My little phosphate is still here. Now, after the protein assumes this alternate shape, this phosphate will be cleaved off, and that causes this protein to re return back to its original shape that we started with. All right? So, 
So the energy of ATP is actually used to change the shape of the protein, and that shape change is responsible for moving a substance from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. One really important example of um, active transport is transport by what's called the sodium potassium pump. So this is active transport that moves sodium and potassium across the cell membrane and actually is responsible for establishing a concentration gradient of both of these ions across the cell membrane. So this is establishing a concentration gradient. And we'll talk in just a minute about uh, what this concentration gradient is used for. But first, let's see how this sodium potassium pump works to set up this concentration gradient. Let's try that again. Let's draw in our phospholipid bilayer first. And then add in our sodium potassium pump, which I have to say, looks absolutely nothing like these drawings, but they serve to get the point across. Okay, so again, let's say this is the outside of the cell, this is the inside of the cell. This pump establishes a gradient where we have high sodium concentration outside the cell low sodium concentration inside the cell, and conversely, low concentration of potassium outside the cell, high concentration of potassium inside the cell. And how does it do that? Well, again, it uses the energy of ATP to establish and maintain this concentration gradient. So we have low concentration of sodium in here, higher concentration of sodium out here, low concentration of potassium out here, and a higher concentration of potassium in here. So this pump, again, can exist in you know different shapes, and when the protein is in the shape where it's open to the inside of the cell, to the cytoplasm, sodium can bind, and in fact, not one but three sodium ions actually bind to the sodium potassium pump and the energy of ATP causes a change in the shape of this protein. Right? So we get this shape change that leads to those sodium ions being released now to the extracellular environment, so contributing to this higher concentration of sodium ions out here. Oops, forgot my little phosphate there. All right, now conversely, when the protein is open to this side of the membrane, potassium ions can bind. And so this pump will bind two potassium ions when this phosphate is cleaved off, just like we talked about before. The protein returns to its original shape, so we get another shape change. And when it does, it releases those potassium ions to the intracellular environment, so contributing to the already high concentration of potassium inside the cell. So establishing and maintaining this concentration gradient of high sodium outside, low sodium inside, low potassium outside, high potassium inside. Right? So, so you might ask yourself, well, what's the point of that? What is that concentration gradient um, then used for? So what is that? sodium potassium concentration gradient that's established by the sodium potassium pump used for? Well, several things. Um, it's actually the basis for the electrical signaling that occurs in the nervous system. So the separation of those ions across the cell membrane is a form of energy, right? You're generating a concentration gradient and under stimulation, those ions can be allowed to move. That movement of those charges actually generates an electrical signal. That's how our neurons communicate with one another. So without that concentration gradient being established, we'd have no signaling in the nervous system. A second thing that that concentration gradient does for the cell is it maintains 
uh, an appropriate osmotic balance, that is an appropriate concentration of ions inside and outside the cell. Uh, and that is really important for regulating water flow, so preventing uh, excess water from moving in or out of cells in ways that they shouldn't. Another thing that this concentration gradient is used for is something referred to as secondary active transport. So the movement of sodium and potassium across the membrane to establish that concentration gradient is referred to as primary active transport. Once that concentration gradient is established, it can be used to drive the movement of other solutes against their concentration gradient. So essentially using energy to generate energy in the form of concentration gradients and then that can be used to do other sorts of work. Okay, so let's draw in our phospholipid bilayer. We're going to have carrier proteins that are going to be participating in this transport that can change shape and in so doing move something across the membrane. Now, so what we've established here through the activity of the sodium potassium pump is a high concentration of sodium outside the cell, low concentration inside. Right, so we have a lot of sodium out here compared to in here. All right, so the way that the cell would use this concentration gradient would be to move another substance, for example, let's say glucose, make that blue here, right, which is lower concentration outside the cell compared to inside. So the cell already has some glucose inside, if you think about that, it sort of makes sense that the cell would want to have the ability to continue to transport glucose into the cell even though there's already some glucose in there. Glucose is a source of energy, right? So getting more glucose in means the cell has more energy for later on. So the way that this works then is that this protein will only change shape when both sodium and glucose have bound. That leads to shape change which in turn leads to the release of both sodium and glucose to the inside of the cell, right? So sodium has moved down its concentration gradient. That's actually the energy source, the driving force for moving glucose against its concentration gradient from low concentration to high. And glucose isn't the only solute that gets transported like that. Other nutrients like amino acids also get transported in conjunction with uh, sodium moving down its concentration gradient. Calcium uh, is another one. So this is a really important mechanism by which cells can use a concentration gradient of one ion to drive the movement of lots of different materials against their concentration gradients. So this concentration gradient that gets established by the sodium potassium pump is actually really important. Uh, by some estimates fully a third of your food calories that you eat every day go to making the ATP that supports the function of that sodium potassium pump. Uh, and this is why, you know, it's, it's involved with all of these important biological activities.